I think a, a very important dimension is to uh, allow God to reveal himself as he really is. So he, we know he's not the you know sugar daddy, papa, ah, oh, yeah, that's okay. Ah, uh-huh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Right. He's not that. No. And yet he's the father that comes running out looking for his son that yeah. squandered his inheritance. Right. He wants to give it, and he understands our fickleness. He is not put off by the fact that I surrender everything to him, and two minutes later, ah, I got it back. <laughs> he understands right. our hearts. He understands the fickleness just as a, a father understands his two-year-old, mm-hmm. that he's going to walk him through it again. He'll walk him through it again. He will not give up on us. Sister Regina Marie Gorman, thank you very much for being with us on Focus. Happy to be here. And uh, you're a a member of the Carmelite Sisters of the Sacred Heart of Los Angeles. Carmelite Sisters of the Most Sacred Heart of Los Angeles. I apologize, yeah. Sorry, sorry. The Most Sacred Heart um, of Los Angeles, a community of how many? 120. 120 women. Uh, And you've been a member of the community for a long time. You've been, you were the, have you been the head of the community at some point? Is that one of your titles? I, I was for a while, I was su- superior yeah. general. Okay, so um, the the spirituality then of the Sacred Heart is not a new thing for you. You've been exposed to this for a long time. It's part of who we are. It is. It's part of the whole Carmelite spirituality for all Carmelites or, or for your monastery in particular? It's for, it's of all Carmelites yeah. because Carmel is the order of encounter. Okay. It, of the presence of God. Yeah. And we, as a, a, an institute within the order, um, were born out of the Mexican persecution. In 1921, we uh, were established in 1927. Our beloved, saintly foundress, Mother Luisita, she's a uh, venerable, brought her sisters across the border to Los Angeles for safety reasons. She had very young sisters. And the suffering that they witnessed, the suffering they endured, Mm -hmm. marked our community. So Carmelite Sisters of the Most Sacred Heart, of His Wounded Heart. And uh, so today you have schools and you you do retreats and all of that is part of your community. We do, and we also uh, accompany elders and their families. We We care for elders and their families during the last stages of life. So we accompany people from very young young children in schools, high schools, uh, retreats, families, married women, priests, and elders. So you're uh, in Carmel, so to speak, and but you're not re- in retreat from the world, are you? You're not, you haven't run away from the world. So that we were given a very unique charism and that we are bona fide Carmelites and our mission is to make known the love of the Sacred Heart, to stand with Our Lady in the presence of God and with Our Lady to make His love known and visible. So the the, the devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus is um, it's maybe the most widespread devotion, I don't know, but certainly it's at the heart of all the devotions of the, of the Church. Well, you light up when I said that. Why, why, why this is something you can affirm it's at the heart it's at the heart of because everything comes from the one who loves yes the center of of his love and this heart was wounded and it was wounded specifically for us given over handed over for us so any other devotion comes from that yeah, as a matter of fact, our whole church comes from that, really. Exactly. Yeah. So the this um, devotion to the Sacred Heart, then it's not. It, it, I, I I'm trying to. I want to say this in the in a way that's fair, but it, we we're so worldly in many ways, many of us Catholics, and and it's hard to see how does this 
you know, this image of Jesus with the Sacred Heart, how does this relate to what I'm doing every day, what I'm going through every day? Can you help me with that? I would love to. Look at the Gospel of John. <laughs> okay. All right, so the very first opening words of John is, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And that doesn't mean like static, I'm sitting a cup next to, it's, it's with the saucer. Yeah. It's a very dynamic turning towards, orienting towards. The sun is always orienting towards the Father, always turning towards the Father. At the end of the first chapter, John says, and it was the Word, the Son, only the Son, who was closest to the Father's heart. Ah, uh, yeah. Mm, same chapter, beginning and end. And then you go to the end of, almost to the end of the Gospel, the, the night of the Last Supper. Who is reclining on the heart of Jesus? Oh, the beloved disciple. And, and just, how did you name him right now? The beloved disciple, right. which he's also called Son. Jesus, oh, from, yeah. the, from the cross, doesn't say, John, no. he says, son, behold, behold your, your mother. mother. Mother, behold your son. So he's called by the beloved disciple. He calls himself, the, I, the, he was running with Peter, but this, the disciple whom Jesus loved. When they don't have the, the, the personal pronoun, it's standing, this is for everybody. This is... You are the beloved disciple. You are to be the son. And this is where we get our grounding. This is where we get our identity, is we've been called to rest on the heart of Jesus. Without exception, that this is, this is our place of comfort. This is our place of security, as any father knows what is when his child crawls, crawls up into his lap and the security of that child right we are being told this is where you find your rest see you started with that word rest and you ended with that word rest and i think that that to the modern person it's almost an irresistible word because the one thing that the world does not offer is rest sure. Rest from worry, rest, rest from work, rest from, um, you know, every kind of um, challenge, I suppose, Anxiety. being thrown at me. I, I, like, even to drive from here to the bank, you almost feel that it's a fight some days, but, you know, just in traffic, that that there's, and, and the anxiety of it. That, so I don't think we do know rest. I don't think we have rest. And he is saying throughout the scriptures, come to me. Yeah. Come, I, me, I, I, I'm the shepherd. Yeah. I'll, I will give you rest. Uh, you come to me and the f living waters will well up from within you. This is for everyone. This isn't, this isn't for Carmelites. It's for Carmelites to make it known and for people to understand how accessible he is to us. Well, the... Yeah, there's the, without that rest, we're we're really desperate creatures. We really, and I suppose that many of the contemporary sins, many of the things that we're addicted to or attracted to in a way that we can't, you know, control that impulse, or we seem to be not able to control that impulse, or uh, you know, whether it could be anything from food to gambling to sex to any, all these that in many ways maybe with with real rest with real divine rest we that cycle can break in us absolutely because w when we rest yeah we start to think we start to have freedom of choice we start to think clearly and we start to be able to make decisions from a place of intelligence, of like a, hum, a real human act. Yes. Instead of being driven or reacting or grasping. 
are rolling down the river like everybody else is, but acting and moving from our real identity. That's, that's the, the great loss of our Sabbath, that we're supposed to be set apart. We don't have to work seven days a week. We yes. don't have to be frenetic. Yeah. We can rest. We can enjoy beauty. We can enjoy laughter, friendship, dimensions of our lives that don't produce, that yeah. just are. I really, uh, I, I have the sense, if people believed you, sister, if, if you know anybody watching this, maybe not, not Catholic, maybe they're not Christian, maybe, um, or a, a former or whatever, if they believed you that turning to the sacred heart of Jesus would bring a rest to your own heart, would bring a, uh, this living water that refreshes, I think everybody would say, how do I get it? But so I, I suppose it's a two-step thing. First to be convincing that he really will give what he says he gives. Come to me, all you labor and are heavy burdened. Um, and then the, probably to be convinced of that, then I would turn to a person like you and say, all right, sister, tell me, how do I get it? How do I get that? So first of all, in your time in monastery, in your time as a woman religious, you have experienced this, the restfulness offered in Christ? Oh, yes. You have? Oh, yes. And, and I have spoken to large groups. And there can be 50 priests and 50 sisters and 50 lay people. And when I say I have met more truck drivers and housewives, um, engineers, bankers that are contemplative, then I've met priests and sisters. And the priests and sisters all nod their head, yes. Really? Yes. People really? who love and people who give and people who live authentic lives, they can be very, very ordinary people. But God is permitted into their lives and their hearts. And there's a familiarity with them and they have no clue the gift of prayer that they have, it's its just, it's so much a part. It's like you don't hear your own accent. Yeah. But he is available. hes He doesn't play tricks on us. He is who he, he says he is. Yeah. And the, that promise that the, the you're, to be, to live in that, uh, in that relationship with him is to be like a tree planted by mm. water. That's right. And and we're just it, all around us, everywhere is thirsting and restlessness and burning in the hot sun of this you know never ending busy culture, and we don't we're not planted by water. We we're not like a tree planted by water. So, you know what a, a very, very simple practice is? I would encourage every night before you go to bed, read a line from Scripture. Ah. It is the living Word of God. Mm -hmm. And when you receive, when you eat, when you take within yourself the living Word of God, it, it's planted. And it grows in your heart, and it starts to shape you. And let that fill your mind. If, if we understood the beauty and the dignity of our mind, we'd probably be a little bit more careful of what we th throw oh, in there. What goes in there, yeah. What goes in there. Right, right, right. And the, and the, the eyes and ears being the main windows in, into the soul, what we let in. Exactly. It, it, it does matter. It, it matters what's and and I, I I'll take you up on the reading a line of scr of scripture. It does seem to me that um, that word is so powerful, and His presence in the Eucharist is so powerful, and in the sacraments is so powerful that a um, great deal of damage can be repaired with just a drop of that. Yes, 
that we don't, you don't have to, I mean, not everyone has to enter Carmel. That's right. That this, we are not the first vocation. Adam and Eve, marriage was the first vocation. Right. So that, that, um, I hope that people, at the very least, especially young people, I hope they will be enticed by this idea of rest that you presented because they need it so badly and they can have a human life and they can live a truly humane life if they have it. So now I would, and maybe they will be convinced by that. Maybe they'll take more convincing. I don't know, but help us to get to, I mean, you've begun to already without me asking, but walk us through what's the life that avails itself of that offered presence of God in the sacred heart of Jesus. How do I come closer to the sacred heart of Jesus? One is desire. All the great saints, Teresa of Avila, John of the Cross, place great emphasis on what is it that you desire? Because your desire is going to lead you. And so what is it in your heart that you're seeking for? If you are seeking only wealth or notoriety, realize that's limited. Mm -hmm. It's not predictable. Right. It's yeah. not lasting. So you, the, the, what I set my desire on, but I, I don't know if I'm entirely in control of that, sister. I mean, maybe you can help me with that. But We, we start to foster I, desires, okay. and you can nurture desires. Oh, without question. Yes, I see what you're saying. Yeah, right. The, the thing that I'm, I'm feeding... That yes. I'm kind of building that up. Yes. Yeah. And okay. so if you're desiring the peace that only God can give you. Okay. You desire it. And if you desire it, you will start to ask for it. Mm -hmm. Like on the night of the resurrection, when his friends had all bailed ship on him and denied him. And what was his first words? Peace be with you. Peace. Shalom. Yeah. He's the one that gives it and wants to give it. Mm. But he won't force it down our throats because he because he honors our freedom. But he but he will never uh deny the sincere request for it. I mean, I don't know if you even have to be that <laughs> sincere in the sense of fully knowing what you're doing, saying, I want it, Lord. I want I want this peace. Can you will you give it to me? He yeah. will give it to us. He he will walk you to it. Yeah. Um, well, then I have I see. Uh, the, I, well, I, I shouldn't say. I don't know what everyone. Everyone has their own struggle. But um, I used to have this uh, Jehovah's Witness friend, and he always said to me, "I have no trouble turning everything over to the Lord." And one minute later, I take it all back. Yeah. And I thought I always thought that was a very wise thing to say. Yeah. So how how do we how do we um. You know, I suppose every, anyone can be enthusiastic for the moment, but how do we make this uh, the a genuine turning of the self over to and putting our head like the beloved disciple on his heart, saying, I, "I this is this is where I want to be, Lord, where you're offering this rest." I think the, um, a very important dimension is to uh, allow God to reveal Himself as he really is. So he, we know he's not the, you know, sugar daddy, papa, ah, oh, yeah, that's okay. Ah, uh -huh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Right. He's not that. No. And yet he's the father that comes running out looking for his son that yeah. squandered his inheritance. Right. He wants to give it, and he understands our fickleness. He is not put off by the fact that I surrender everything to him, and two minutes later, ah, I got it back. <laughs> he understands right. our hearts. He understands the fickleness, just as a, a father understands his two-year-old, mm -hmm. that he's going to walk him through it again. He'll walk him through it again. He will not give up on us until there's a day when the tide of his love overtakes. It soaks in. It's, it's who we are. And I think that's the most important thing he, for you to really know he understands you. Mm, yeah. And he understands what you're wanting. He understands your weakness. Yeah. And he will not give up on you. 
Yeah, there's always the temptation. To, uh, I'll turn to him just as soon as I've cleaned up my act a little bit, or I've, <laughs> I've over. Let me just because I don't want him to have to deal with this part. But that that doesn't work. It doesn't. <laughs> it doesn't work at all. No, he yeah. is the one that will pick us up, and he. How yeah. many times a mother or a father wipes the face of a child during the yeah. course of the day? Right. And they don't, it's just this part, they, they don't expect anything different. Ah, oh, that's very helpful, sister. Yeah, that's a very good image. Yeah, don't expect, it, it, right. It, the, um, it's, it's a strange thing because you hear people say, you know, I'm, I'm good enough. And it's, that, it's not that, it's that he, he knows that we're not going to be good enough without him. He's he's going to give it all to us. I don't know quite how to express it, but I have this sense from what you said of it's it's not acceptance of where you are, but it's acceptance of who you are. Yes. And that's really hard for us. Yeah. And our acceptance of who I am is the essential piece of creation. It's the essential piece of who I am. It's not that, oh, you know, I used to be a teacher and I, yeah. I'm this. Right. I'm a daughter. Yeah. Like, I'm a daughter. Yeah. I don't have to use the doorbell. No. I'm at home. Uh, yes. I have direct access. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, well, now I have three adult children. Um, and I have this question and I know almost every parent I know of adult children has, how do I share this with my children? You know, they've, some go to church sometimes, some don't go to church at all. You know, some, some get it, uh, some don't get it. Some seem to want it. Some seem to not really want it. What, how do we, because I feel so enlivened by what you're saying, but as a parent, my first thing is, I want you to give this to my kid. Could you visit with my children, sister, please? I want them to have it. That's So help us parents out. All right. So you can't do that. It's yours. And you can't use words. Look, Jesus is constantly saying throughout the gospel, predominantly John's, he's constantly saying, I, I only do what the Father tells me to do. Yeah. If Thomas, if you know me, you know the Father. Yeah. Philip, how long have I been with you? If you know me, you know the Father, because the Father's in me, and I'm in the Father, and He's in me, and I'm in you. And He's constantly saying it until He gets the apostles fairly mature. And now He's saying, You go. I'm in you. Mm -hmm. You. You make the Father known now. As I made the Father known, you're going to make me known. Your person. Yeah. Not your words, but mm -hmm. how you are. I'm breathing into you. I'm giving my life to you. I'm giving you my authority and my power. And it's living in you as I live in the Father. You are to live in me. We have a a, a great family a friend of ours up in up in Los Angeles area, and he, one of the sons is a clown, kind of teasing all the time. And we were running into him fairly often, pro life dinners, another gala. You know, we're ending up at his table, and he says well, at one point he says, "I I'd like you sisters to meet my mom." It's like, oh, okay, she's not in good health. Oh, sure, we're, we're, we're well. It turns out she's not far from us. And she's been away from the church for 60 years. And she is moving towards death. So we started showing up at a doorstep and singing to her on Christmas and uh -huh. this neighborly type of things. Well, it turns out, as we got to know it, there was no impediment. There was a wound, but there was nothing holding her back from the church. And she'd been away for 60 years. She's, we're, we're talking six weeks, eight weeks out from death. So when she realized that she could freely come back, there's nothing. We, a priest friend was called in, and we had a mass. The children were completely taken by the change in grandma. 
who was anxious oh. and fearful and self-absorbed. And once she had been to confession, and the mercy and love and warmth of Jesus was just poured into her. Yes, yes. She couldn't do anything but enjoy life. She enjoyed her children. She enjoyed being with her grandchildren. Oh, wow. There was new life. The entire family, which is probably about 20-some, over a course of the next three years, all came into the faith. Oh, that... Because of the witness of the power of what they saw in the demeanor and response and quality of life that their grandmother had when she accepted the fullness of what Christ had to offer her. And that's, the, that's your role as a parent, mm. is being so close to Jesus, allowing Jesus to live within you, that they see your children and grandchildren see something in you they can't argue with. We can't argue with beauty. No. You can't right. argue with joy. You can't argue with goodness. Mm -hmm. you're, you're compelled by it. So, uh, oh, you give me the look like I need to go out and do this now. <laughs> okay, sister, I've taken the, I'll take the challenge up. I appreciate it. Uh, but uh, are, in the devotion to the Sacred Heart, is there, I mean, because in the Catholic Church, we have all, as we said, many, many devotions. And, um, and but the sacred heart is of Jesus is at the center of everything. So I guess there's two things I want to ask you before we go. One, I think it's hard for people to believe that Jesus knows them and loves them with his human heart. We can do we we know that he I mean God God is love. Okay, so in a certain kind of abstract way that we can get that. Yeah, okay, God is love, God loves me. But to think that he has taken on human flesh and as a man, as our brother who's chosen to be one, one among us, he loves me with his human heart. So I want you to help me with that. And then I want you to tell me, just in a practical sense, how would one take up a devotion to the sacred heart of Jesus? Number one, this is such an insidious little twist that can happen. We all agree. No one's going to contradict St. John who says God is love. Right. But the little twist that's not helpful is that can become so vague. And love yeah. is never anonymous. Uh, it's yeah. never vague. It's right. personal. It's a relationship. And for us to really receive, because it's bigger than what we, we can grasp with our little minds, we can't wrap our minds around, no. that he loves. And as a parent, though, you probably do get it. That, oh, so you loved your, your firstborn? Yes. So then when your secondborn came, you had to divide your love 50-50? <laughs> yes, and, no, not at all. Yeah. Not, right, yeah. And it's the yeah. same. God loves each one of us fully. You know the, the, the parables, he, he, oh, the, the workers that only worked half day, and then the work, workers that sweat all day long, and then they all got the same. Yeah. You know what he's saying? God doesn't do fractions. He doesn't do <laughs> That's fractions. That's beautiful. Yes, right. It's he only, all or nothing. It's, he is the whole thing. You can have the whole thing. He gives. I love you completely. Exactly. Yeah. He, he loves you with an undivided, complete heart. He has given his heart to you. And so the, the image of the sacred, there's a couple images. You know, there's some that he's pulling back his, his garments. So you can see it. So he's saying, I'm showing you. I'm making myself understandable. Yeah. I'm making myself visible to you. Right. And then there's one where he points to it like, hello, look, yeah. for you. The one that I love the most, and I, I associate it um, with, the, with Ignatius of Loyola it's, it, it, in the Jesu over in Rome. He has his heart in his hand. It's oh. because of St. Margaret Mary, I believe. Margaret Mary, he handed, he's offering. The heart is being extended, but we have to accept it. We have to take it. And we want to say, especially in our culture, well, I'm not worthy. Like, I don't have my act together. Like, you don't know what I've done. I don't think I've done it. No, he's not asking any questions. This is mm. not, he's offering you his heart. And will you accepted will you give his heart 
space to live within your heart. Mm-hmm. And that's the Eucharist. And the beautiful part of it is we're all broken. But the heart that he offers us, his heart is broken. His heart is wounded. It is pierced. And you know the story of Teresa of Avila. She's having a vision. Oh, yeah, with the angel. With the, no, the... no. She's having a vision, and there's a sister there, and she, Teresa's talking. The sister can see the vision, but she can't hear it. So the sister's taking notes of what Teresa of Avila says. And after a couple of minutes, she says to the sister, Sister, go get the holy water. Yes, Mother. So she goes gets the holy water, and Mother St. Teresa sprinkles the holy water on the image of Jesus, and it disappears. And the sister said, how'd you know that wasn't Jesus? He had no wounds. Oh, wow. Jesus always shows his wounds. He is broken for us to be given to us. Yeah. We don't have to be ashamed of our wounds. Yeah. Because he comes with his wounds to heal ours. Wow. Really enjoyed talking with you, sister. I like this conversation very, very much. It's true. It's all true. That's the thing. It's all true. It is. And he wants to give himself to you. Yeah. As you are right now, today. But the question is, will you allow him to love you? As you are right now, today. And we answer that question by, how do we do that? I mean, if, the, if that's the question, the answer, if I want to say yes to him, You just say that. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Oh, I got you. Come. You're welcome. I I have a messy heart, but come on in. And he'll come. He will. Standing at the door of our heart. Amen. Knocking. Knocking. Yeah. Um, What a beautiful conversation, Uh, Sister uh, Regina Marie Gorman. I really appreciate it. Thank you for the time, and thank you for sharing. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, Sister, I want to ask you one more question. If I may, could you tell me a little bit about Elizabeth of the Trinity? Because I said I was going to ask you about that, and I didn't ask you about. Is that right, Elizabeth of the Trinity? Elizabeth of the Trinity. Yeah. Well, first off, let me tell you how I got to know her. Okay. I entered the convent when I was tw- almost 20. Like, I knew a lot. Yes. Yeah, right. I was me really, too. Yeah, I was really smart when I was 20. And <clears throat> it was good. I was, I was happy to be there. And then after a while, like, okay, I think this is enough. I'm, these clothes are uncomfortable. I just want to, I don't want to quit, quit. I just want to like go to the beach and go, go to the mall, like do something normal. So every time I started to get to that point of, I don't know if I want to do this anymore, I would find a bookmark and it would have this quote that grounded me again. That's like, oh, wait, like, this is who I am. And at the bottom of the card, it always had Sister Elizabeth of the Trinity. <laughs> so I thought, she's really cool. I got to meet her. I wonder which, which nun, because there's a bunch of nuns in the convent, and I wondered which one she was. I'll have to meet her one of these days, because I think she's, it happened probably half a dozen times when I'm just getting ready to say, I don't think I want to do this anymore. I would get a quote from Elizabeth of the Trinity. Well, you know the saying that we don't pick our saints. Oh, I believe that very they much. They yes. pick us out. Right. And Elizabeth of the Trinity is a contemporary of Therese. They didn't know each other. They, they had read Therese, um, Therese died first. And Elizabeth did read the circular letter about Therese. So they influenced each other. But Therese, uh, Elizabeth of the Trinity's gift, she knew she, was, she lived in the presence of God. And she knew that God lived within her. And that was her desire to anyone she spoke to, anyone she wrote to, was to help them understand the unbelievable dignity that God is loving them from within all the time. So her letters to her mother, who was a widow, and then her sister, who had a large family and was widowed at a young age, she would write to her teaching them how to live in the presence of God. She, and one of these Carmelites that got it right and died early on, you know, became a saint five years in. But on her deathbed, she said, I will spend my eternity teaching people, drawing souls out of their interior muddle and being able to see how they were really created, that God lives within them and God wants to minister to them from within. 
that she promised to spend her eternity. And to this day, she picks me up when I'm ready to step off the curb, grabs me by the scruff of my neck, and puts me back into truth, yeah, into reality, into right order, which is restful. And it's consoling, and it's very freeing. That's who she is. Well, I'm going to find out about this, sister. Love her. You read her. You cannot not love her. Okay, I will. Well, thank you, sister. Thanks for the the bonus episode of uh, Focus with you, and then a bonus added on to the bonus episode. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thank you. Thank you again. God bless.